You can turn in your Bibles, if you already have them, to Acts chapter 2, verse 22 is where we're going to start. If you haven't got a Bible, we got those. If you have your Bible and you found Acts 22, I'm going to ask you to just bow your head and your heart. And Lord, we just ask you to anoint our ears today to hear what you have to say, because this, um, I'm afraid sometimes this can go past us without us really grasping what is going on. So Father, I ask you to give me everything needed to make the point. But Father, this is truly some life-changing stuff here today. And we just thank you, Lord God, for all of that. And help us to really see and appreciate just what you've done for us, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, um, talking about not always getting something, you know, I get not getting something. You know, as, as I said, as a man, as a husband, there are a lot of times I'm told stuff, I don't get it. I know I'm doing wrong. I know I'm not getting it, but there's still not the light bulb going off that probably should because a lot of times we're just thinking past each other. Even last night discussing something about a car, which is my wheelhouse. Don't try to tell me. There are very very few people I will allow to tell me something about a car. You have to be a mechanic for me to listen to you most of the time about a car. So there's no need in my wife trying to explain to me why the tires are wearing out on the front of the car, because I already know that. But there was a miscommunication going on in this, shall I say, conversation last night. I've been sick for the last two days, so I'm medicated. I am just not really want to talk about a car. I just want to go back into the coma that I just came out of, because I know today is today, and all that's going on. So... We were just discussing um, something about a car, and, and as it does and it shouldn't do, my volume starts easing up because I'm frustrated that what I'm trying to say is not getting across. And I don't want to have to go back and give a remedial class on how the front end of a car works and how that makes the tires wear out. But in her end of the conversation, which I must say, her volume never increased, or I couldn't hear it. My head is full of stuff. So at, at any rate, she was doing well, but we were talking past each other about this, so finally I think she just gave up and went up front, which was totally fine with me. Um, and I'm not, trying to be, I'm not trying to be flippant about that. What I'm trying to say is there are so many times when something is put right in front of us and we still don't really see it, and I think a lot of times because it's because we're either talking past each other or in the case of the disciples and those to whom Jesus is, is ministering, has been ministering to all this time, that what He is saying and their idea of what He is trying to tell them are not jiving. They're not jihawing. They are not lining up. And so many times they talk past each other. Now, the to be honest with you, we look back on that sometimes and we go, good grief, those guys are just stupid. Could Jesus have picked a dumber bunch to be his disciples? And the problem is, is I guess what you could liken to chronological snobbery. Because we're looking in hindsight all the way back, having now gotten all of the New Testament having, if we're smart, taking that back to the Old Testament and then coming back into the New Testament with it. And we can, it's a lot, it's much easier to see what Jesus was saying, even though I will tell you this, though you know it or not, there are a lot of things still argued and debated about in the scholarly community about what was actually said. And that shouldn't worry you that much. It should show you that we still have some studying to do. But the point I'm trying to make is that if you know where they're coming from, then you should see that it would not have been that obvious to us either, even if if we had been some of the most well-versed Jewish scholars, people, fishermen, or anyone else of the day, what Jesus was saying. Because though they had been looking for a Messiah, at no point really, was a, were a whole lot of people talking about the Messiah being divine. He was just another king. You had this idea of, of a Davidic king, and you have this idea, idea of a Messiah, and you do have, you have this idea, of, an idea excuse me, of another prophet that's coming, and then you have this other 
this idea of the anointed at one time. And the problem is the way they're spoken about, they weren't always linked. And so they're sitting there hearing one thing and they've been expecting this, mainly this idea of a Davidic king to come all throughout history and conquer the pagans and Israel goes back to the top of the list, basically. And the other ideas, they just really don't always know what to do with it. They certainly don't know to merge these things into one person, to, especially the son, the son of God. That is, and those, those phrases are used, they really don't know what to do with it. And then Jesus comes along and he starts using a phrase here and a phrase there and he picks out an idea. And I, I say he picks out an idea. He quotes something here and he quotes something here. And then when, it, when they all try to funnel it in, it just does not compute. And I'm here to tell you, it wouldn't have computed for most of us either. It had to take something supernatural, really, which is when Peter at Caesarea Philippi says, where do we go? Thou art the Christ. That's not Jesus' last name. It's a title. You are the anointed. And he says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood is not revealed to this to you, but the the power of God has done that. It was a supernatural revelation. And so as well as as big as I am on the academic things, what you have to understand is that without the spiritual part of it, these things cannot mean or don't necessarily mean as much to us as they should. Now, last week we talked about the catalyst, and I'm trying to wrap this up better. I I, I did get some constructive criticism um, from someone, which is fine. They're not here today. They don't even go here, so... But um, that I made good points, but I didn't wrap it up well. And I'll take that because I, I, that is where I struggle. But at the same time, we're kind of going through a... Think of this as watching Netflix. All right, we're in a series. So I can't always wrap up everything very neatly because the next week we build right into it. So last, night, last week, we talked about the catalyst. And that is that was the coming of the Holy Spirit. I talked about the method which was the method of getting the gospel out, which was praising God and what I'll call gospeling under the power of the Holy Spirit. And the message, that being the kingdom of God. I want you to read and pay attention closely to what is being said, because what is not just being said is when you die, you get to go to heaven. That is one line, if I can call it that, of the gospel. The gospel that Jesus taught, the gospel that's being taught here, and the gospel that if you read Paul, all of what he's saying, and don't focus down on one or two little things, the bigger picture is the gospel of the kingdom, and that's what changes people's lives. That is the difference between, all right, now I get to go to heaven when I'm dead, and I'll just kind of kick around here till Jesus comes back, or what have you, or maybe I'll do some witnessing, and what the gospel of the kingdom really does for you. So the message was the gospel of the kingdom. This week we're going to see um, some of the outworkings of what happened when these things all came together here at Pentecost. The fact is that they continue to operate. All this that's going on, the power of the Holy Spirit and people are speaking in in tongues uh, and they're praising God and people, as we'll see, are getting saved. Uh, When all this hits at one time, sort of the perfect storm, And the fact is that they continue to operate beyond the first half of Acts chapter 2, which is where we are today. And they continue to work throughout the book of Acts and are, in fact, still operating today. Now, why do we not necessarily see these types of conversions today? I'm mainly talking about maybe in the masses or whatever. We read these things and go, wow, I don't see that in Woodstock or around Atlanta or whatever. You might see it here or there. But I would argue that we do see them working especially in the third world and even Muslim countries today where people uh, have a little different way of looking at things and where God is still moving and trying to save the masses there. If we aren't seeing some of these things in our sphere, then maybe we need to ask ourselves why and get back to the basics of what it actually takes to make disciples. All right? Now, you may remember last week how Peter stood up in order to defend what was happening by assuring the skeptics that those who were being moved by the Spirit were not drunk. All right, And he says, look, something that everybody knew, many people probably know here today, nobody is snockered at 9 a.m. If they are, this is a hungover from last night. 
you know, it's something big deal. But these guys are not drunk. He then launched into an apologetic message, all right, where he's defending the faith. He's describing what's going on here, where he quoted the prophet Joel. And he does that in order to assure the hearers that they had entered into what is known as the last days. Peter said the last days started now, right here at Pentecost. And I defined that last week. As he goes on, he uses the words of the prophet to show that since the criterion of the last days had been met, then Jesus must be the Messiah. Because the advent of the Messiah and then the advent of the last days, those things had to coincide. That's why he's quoting the prophet. And then if Jesus is Messiah, the King of Israel, hear that, the King of Israel, then all who call upon him shall be saved. All right, I can do that now. I actually got something to bang on. I just realized that Mike was talking about that earlier. I got something to beat on now. So Peter then launched in the last few verses we dealt with last week. He launched into this doctrine of salvation, but we need to see kind of how he's doing it because I believe it goes beyond what many say about that today. All right, which is just do this, say this word, and then you, when you die, you go to heaven. If that is what we're calling the gospel, or if that is all we're calling the gospel, then no wonder the church, especially in the West, is so whatever. I'm looking for a word right now. Gaunt, um, lacking, uh, almost dead, uh, whatever. Just think of something like that. So we're going to continue with the method of the message, which has come about by the catalyst of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 22. Uh, Peter here continuing his message. He says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Now go and teach that today, and you will wound someone's inner child. Do you hear what he said? Him being delivered by the uh, purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands. And this language is a lot sweeter than it really can be in the Greek. You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified, and you put him to death. You are responsible for killing him. That's what he says to the very people who are in the area. Once again, we can't be saying that because that's not sweet. The Bible is, a lot of times, is not always sweet. All right? If you really read it the way it's supposed to be read, Jesus wasn't always sweet. He was very often sarcastic. I love that. The Apostle Paul is very often sarcastic. All right, and his comebacks. And if, if you don't understand that, then you're not understanding the context. But Peter here in this message, in this, the, this part of his message, takes them back to just a few weeks previously where apparently many of those present had already been in Jerusalem for Passover. Now it's 50 days later. They're at the Feast of Pentecost. Those who had the money and the wherewithal could have stayed there in Jerusalem for that month and a half or whatever, between those uh, um, festivals from out of town. We do see, we know from the de the, what's told, of us, told to us about Pentecost, that there were people from all over the Roman Empire, wherever the Jewish people had been scattered. All right? So these people are here. And this means that what he says there is that they had seen and or heard about all that went on concerning the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But it even goes back further than that because he mentions, uh, he alludes to some of the other things and miracles and stuff that had happened with Jesus in his ministry. All right? Peter then refers to the hearers, refers them back to all these other signs and wonders which Jesus did. And this is proof that he, Jesus, must be who he said he was. And Peter says that these things were done in their midst, at least in the midst of some of them. He says, you know he did these things. And he's exclaiming, you can see in the Greek, he's just, he's just you know this. He's not sitting up there like this, 
speaking in the King James Version. He said, y'all know all the stuff he said, y'all. He said, because he's a hillbilly. He said, y'all know all the stuff that he did. Y'all have heard about it. You've seen it. You know that he was uh, had to go to the kangaroo court. You know he was crucified. You know if you were anywhere around, and we have all these witnesses, that he rose on the third day. But he goes on to say this. He doesn't just lambast them, but because you know today a lot of people would hear that part and check out. I don't want to hear that. I'm going to my safe space. Click off of that. And go somewhere else. He goes on to say that all this was done through the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, meaning simply this, that all of this has gone according to plan. So in one fell swoop, Peter does a couple of things. First of all, he states that God has planned all this throughout the ages. All right? And that would then, in their mind, go all the way back to Genesis, to the dominion mandate, to eventually all that happened in Genesis 6, then you come to the Tower of Babel and the dispersion of the nations. And then on the heels of that comes this deal with Abraham and talking about the land and your seed and how through him and his seed, Israel, how the entire earth is going to be blessed. If you don't get all of that, then a lot, most of what you read in the New Testament is not going to make any sense, really. All right. So first of all, he states that God has planned all of this ages ago, which makes the case for God's sovereignty, which is such a large part of the Jewish faith. That no matter what happened, we know something's going to happen. They're going to argue about it, when it's going to happen. But God is coming back at some time to set things right. And they've been waiting for the Messiah, believing that God would produce him as he had promised. And then Peter turns around and backhands them. After talking about God's sovereignty, God planned all this, and then he backhands them with their own responsibility in what all has recently taken place. Slap, slap. Two sides of the same coin. God's sovereignty and our personal responsibility. You, he says, and this is what they would have heard. You, he says, through the, through the courts of the Gentiles, has seen to it that Jesus... The Messiah was crucified like a common criminal. You took our heritage and our fate and you placed it in the hands of the power that is right now oppressing us. He's kind of saying you have aired our inner denominational dirty laundry or what have you, our inner community, our contextual dirty laundry. You have put it out there and you've given ammunition to the very people that are oppressing us. You killed the one who came to free us. And when he said that, that would have gone over like a lead balloon. But you see, the Israelites prided themselves on being in independent of their Gentile masters. And Peter just told them that they had played in the hands of the Gentiles by airing their in-house issues and then allowed the Romans to crucify one of their own. Why would you send one of your own to the Gentiles? Especially... And with what Peter's saying now, knowing who he is. But it wasn't just anyone that they sent. It was the Messiah, the one whom they've been waiting for all this time. He says, you saw the miracles. You heard what he said and you rejected him. But he doesn't stop there. As I said, because of God's grace, he gives them an out. Because of God's grace and foreknowledge. And then Peter goes on to explain how the plan was to work. And he does so by going back to the Old Testament in order to see that King David, the most respected king of Israel, had known about this very thing. Look at verse 25. So Peter makes his speech. He rolls right into quoting the Old Testament here. He says, For David says concerning him, that'd be most Bibles to say capital H, that's a little key, uh, clue that he's talking about Jesus here. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For He, capital H, is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, the place of departed spirits, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren... Verse 29, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. Now, verse 29, he starts explaining what's going on here. 
Let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, meaning genealogically speaking, he, capital H, would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning David, you could say, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, or the anointed, that his soul was not, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted, past tense, to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, and that's a play on words, um, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, he's going to get that jab in there again, both Lord and Christ. Now, I just I read a whole lot there. But Peter tells them that while they had been responsible in the immediate sense for Jesus' death, God had known all along that this would happen, and in fact it had to happen. God had no qualms with Jesus being put to death because death could not hold him. How can Peter say this? Because it was written in the Old Testament. Here, Peter quotes Psalm uh, 16, verses 8 through 11, which upon first glance, and to many, back in the Old Testament days, they would say, oh, this is talking about King David. But they're not seeing all of it. There's some of it that can refer to King David. There are also some qualities here that cannot refer to King David. And, what, and Peter is telling them, he's buried right over there. So he has not ascended. Therefore, the psalm cannot be talking about him. But if we read this carefully, we can see this. Verse 29, he says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. So here Peter tells them that this psalm cannot refer to David because he was buried in Jerusalem. David had not resurrected. His body was still in the tomb, and it surely had decayed by this time. It's hundreds of years ago that he was buried. Therefore, Jesus, being the only one who had resurrected, has to be the object of the prophecy. So Jesus was indeed a descendant of King David. Read Matthew chapter 1, and you'll see how they make that claim. And in that day, the way they kept up with their, all their relatives... Anyone it could have gone to any of Jesus' family and they could have quickly, the patriarch, anyone of the family could have quickly rattled it off the genealogy. You could have fact-checked it back then all the way back to King David. All right? So there's no problem there, all right, so that he literally comes through David's line, fulfilling one part of the prophecy, but he's also the only one that's resurrected. Look at verse 32. This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, past tense, I keep focusing on that, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If you read 1 Corinthians 15, you'll read much the same language right there. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So the resurrection of Jesus is best explained not as some isolated miracle. And once again, if you don't know all that the Old Testament says, it can easily be seen as that. But it should be seen as the fulfilled promises made by God through King David. And they know that the one who's been resurrected from the dead is the true son and heir of David, which makes Jesus the rightful king of Israel. The resurrection wasn't about some disembodied spirit going away to heaven, leaving a body behind in a tomb. He has to make that point. Sometimes I think we have to make that point. That because a, a body going away, excuse me, a spirit going away and leaving a body in a tomb, 
That is precisely what resurrection doesn't mean. It speaks about a body being very dead and then very alive once more so that the normal decay which follows death never begins. And Peter makes this point by quoting the psalm. The only way to make sense of the psalm is to see it as being prophetic, to see in it a deep Davidic truth that would remain mysterious, cryptic. And you have to understand that if you go back into their, their, all their writings, their commentaries and what have you, uh, from that day, the second temple time, they didn't really, most of the Jewish scholars didn't see that psalm as a messianic psalm. Once again, they just didn't put it together. They're only looking down that one lane road which says, we got a king coming back. But they never connected a Davidic king to a divine person, a son of God. A son of God. Now, there are people wrestling with this. And in those writings, they go all the way back, even to the burning bush with Moses. In the Hebrew, they're saying, and you can read it, they're saying, there are two people in that bush, two divine beings in that bush. And they fight about it now for the next several hundred years, trying to figure it out. But it doesn't, but all they keep saying is the Shema, our Lord, the Lord our God is one, the Lord our God is one. But there's two divine beings in that bush. They can't put the two together. You understand the kind of the, the trap? They, they kind of painted themselves into a corner. We can also do the same thing. All right? But Peter makes this true uh, statement that, um, that one day, this cryptic, it was taken as cryptic, that one day a son of David would appear, somebody from David's line to whom it would actually happen, this resurrection thing. Again, Jesus is the rightful king and is, is the only one who qualifies for such a position through his death and resurrection. And Peter has worked back now, if you're paying attention, he's worked back from the babbling in tongues. We talked about this last week. All the babbling in tongues. He's worked all the way back to the prophet Joel with the argument. He starts there and then he brings it all the way back through the Psalms. Um, in order to prove that they were, in fact, in the last days, most of the Psalms go to the resurrection as a sure sign that Jesus is Messiah. He ties the two points together in verse 33, and then he quotes Psalm 110, which automatically in their mind links to Daniel 7. With, all right, y'all remember Daniel 7, some of you, the enthronement language that's mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 24, of course, is in duh, Daniel 7, where he talks of, one like the Son of Man, ascending to the throne of the Ancient of Days. And they sit there and they hear this language and, and all these scholars are going, wait a minute, hmm? one like the Son of Man. That's kind of a messianic title there, but we're not sure how that works. And he's going to the throne, the Ancient of Days, that's Yahweh. So somebody else is taking the throne. You see, they don't have all the clues. They're struggling with this but it's enthronement language, and Peter is using it here. Um, once again, Jesus referred to this in Matthew 24. If Jesus is the king, then he must be on the throne. That's why I kept enforcing here, uh, emphasizing here earlier, past tense, past tense. These points to the Jews present, uh, to those Jews present, had an awesome effect because it brought the hearers to the place of having to deal with what they have just heard and then squaring that with all they have seen and heard over the past few weeks and maybe even longer than that. He has now, through this, this argument and through the Scripture, brought them to a point that they now have to deal with something. If the prophet said the last days were coming and the prophet said there's a Messiah, this Davidic king, who we're also talking about has, ascend, has past tense, ascended to the throne. And he is the king of Israel, then he has to be the Messiah, and back and forth, those two work off of each other. And they're sitting there, and all of a sudden, what is starting to happen is they're going, we missed it. We missed the Messiah. We missed king. We missed the king. Because we're looking in the wrong place. Just like if somebody told you, um, you know, Super Dave, go to the airport down there and bring this guy back. He's about 6'2", got black hair, and weighs about 250 pounds. But actually, the guy he's looking for is about 5'10", 160 pounds, has blonde hair. 
the guy's going to walk right past you because you're not looking for the right person. Why? Because he had wrong clues or he didn't have all the clues. And that's what Peter is trying to correct here. So now he's given the message and all that. And now in verse 37, we see a response to the message. The hearers respond. And then they res- how do they respond? One, with action, but two, with a question. Look at verse 37. It says, now when they heard this, everyone with an earshot, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And so the message to those who had an ear to hear had put them on notice. That these events, excuse me, and prophecies hadn't happened in a vacuum. The prophecies had been around for generations and everyone there lived in that world of waiting on the Messiah. I don't think we can, the closest we could get to that is maybe thinking about waiting on Jesus' return or something like that or the frenzy that builds up before Y2K or or before maybe even a Super Bowl in, in some little way, all right? But they had been living in this water of waiting on the Messiah. I talked about it in the introduction to, uh, in the introduction to Acts, how the, everything was, had been building to a fever pitch politically around there. So they are primed for this. And Peter had just linked all of these things together. What does the Feast of Pentecost mean? The first fruit, the harvest is beginning. And that's what you see here with Pentecost. The first fruits of the harvest is here. That's why God had it done right there. In that context, it makes so much sense for them. You bring in the first sheaf. The harvest is beginning and you do that to acknowledge God's sovereignty and also to pray for a good harvest. And what happens? They are being harvested right then with the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, Peter links all these two together, these things together, and he was speaking under, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I want you to listen to just how well he had formulated his argument. I talked about it. He starts with the prophet Joel. I talked about it last week. How, why would anybody go there? He was with the prophet Joel. He works his way back logically and prophetically speaking through the Psalms and brings them to a point, a decision. It's, it's very well done. And my question as I'm thinking about this is, Peter, just a few weeks ago, I don't know if he could have articulated anything like this. Have you in any of the Gospels, up to this, any of the writings up to this point, heard Peter articulate much past one or two sentences? I mean, he gets an A plus for thou art the Christ, but past that, he's kind of, you know, he just fell off the putwood truck. And now here he is in the middle of this contention in the very city where Jesus was crucified, where people are still probably on alert. And as soon as the name Jesus comes up, people get afraid to, you know, they go want to hide or somebody else wants to pull out a gun or go call the law, all that stuff. And now he articulates this good argument. Just a few weeks ago, I don't know if he could have done that because the pieces had not yet come together. But now with that catalyst, Being the moving of the Spirit, He's clicking on all cylinders. And we can't forget those who were listening. Because sure, surely, they're doubters, we read that. Oh, they're drunk. And some of them just kind of lie and walked away. And there's some leaning against the post looking back and these people are nuts. These people are crazy. And there's some people running back and saying, y'all got to hear this. Somebody's off, they're off their meds or what have you. And, And Peter, it doesn't matter. Because the Spirit is moving. What does that show you? That even when the Spirit is moving, there are still the skeptics and the doubters. That's fine. They're exercising their free moral agency. They don't have ears to hear. And as long as the enemy is around, those folks will be there. But for those who had an ear to hear, it all made sense. Because he makes a logical case. And now they wanted to know what they could do to rectify the situation because they're the, what do we do? We missed it. We missed the boat. We missed the plane. You walk up, you run up to the gate. Sorry, it's shut off. The thing's taxiing down the runway. What do you do now? Can we catch another flight? And Peter says, yes, you can. And they want to know how could they pledge their loyalty, loyalty to the Messiah, the rightful king. How can they partake in this salvation and all that it entailed? And Peter answers them in the next verse. The question 
that they had is now answered. Verse 38, And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Now, when he makes this decree, that you repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, there aren't folks standing out there going, well, do you do that in the name of Jesus only or in the Trinitarian formula? They're not even thinking of that and don't even go there. All right, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard in my life. You see both of these things going, they don't, under, once again, they don't understand the context. And then the, it told, denominations will divide over this whole sort of thing. But what Peter does say is repent, repent, which literally means to turn around. And one other definition is to see your sin as God sees it. But here it mainly means to turn around. And then more importantly, you have to understand that that idea of repent means more than a cognitive decision. It doesn't mean just go, hmm, well, that makes sense. I think, yes, dear, I think we should do that. Yes, check the box, and here we are. It doesn't work that way. It requires action. It's a verb. So to not turn around... To not live in a different way simply means, it meant then, and it would have to say it means now, that true repentance had not taken place. To say it, and then there not be any evidence of it, shows that somebody didn't turn around. If somebody's going toward the street, right out there toward 75, and you say, turn around, okay, I'm turning around, plow, they didn't turn around. But if you say, turn around, and all of a sudden, about face, and then they head back the other way. Well, obviously they turned around. They didn't get splattered by a car. You see, there has to be something there. All this turning around was to be seen by all. You had to prove it somehow. Not through works, but by fruit. And, in, in, and they were all familiar with this. The one way that you would have done this was through water baptism. That's what he says. Be baptized in Jesus' name. Does the water buy your salvation? No. It simply shows that you have turned around. And they are all familiar with this because throughout the Old Testament, though you don't really read of it, water baptism was practiced. Upon whom? Upon any Gentile proselyte that came in and wanted to be a Jew, wanted to be an Israelite, they wanted to practice a religion. What were they? they were dunked. In their mind, what does this mean? They had seen John the Baptist doing this very thing in the, in the River Jordan. What does that mean? How does that mean to turn around? Because in their mind, in the context, coming up out of water, large bodies of water meant chaos. That's what you see at creation, the first few verses of Genesis. God brings order out of the chaos. When Israel comes through the Red Sea at the Exodus, they're a new creation. Why? Because they've been brought through the waters of chaos. When they cross the Jordan into the promised land, they are now a new nation. They are a new creation in a sense because they've come through the waters. They've crossed through the waters and now they're in the promised land. John the Baptist does the same thing. So when we practice water baptism today, you go down in one sense and you are seen as when you come up. It's not washing anything off. But you are seen as what? A new creation. That's the whole purpose of it. And so when he says this, all of that is automatically going on in their minds. I think sometimes we don't see it. All right. So for the Israelite, that new creation, that new birth, you have to understand that a new creation doesn't behave like the old one. Or it wouldn't be new. And that's not to say every, we're perfect when we come up out of there. All of a sudden, I went in with all this baggage, I come up. No, we are seen that way. But there is the idea of this turning around in a different life that one is now seeking. They were to live in such a way uh, as those who had just been told that there was a new king on the throne. That is literally what is happening. I can't overemphasize that enough. Because when we don't see that, then we kind of look glibly, I think, at some, even the gospel sometimes. Um, there's a new king on the throne, and that's literally what happened. But how would it look different? And these are the questions I think we all ask ourselves. Wasn't Caesar still on the throne in Rome? Wasn't Caesar's puppet 
still ruling over them from his palace in their promised land? Yes, they were. But their power had now taken a major blow. The powers of darkness no longer have any hold on anybody unless they give it to them because death now has no sting. They've called, Jesus has called the bluff, as it were, of the enemy. Um, but Jesus' followers now could supplant that rule. You say, how does that work? I want you to just think about history. How has the world changed since Pentecost? And we think, well, it's not, you know, it's still got a lot of trouble. Yeah, it does. But think about if the church or those in it, the believers in Jesus, however you want to qualify that, think about if we weren't here. To put it in a more crass way, think of the good people as gone. Would you have had the science? Because science is based on Judeo-Christian values. Would you have had the science? And what led to the enlightenment, which leads to the technology and the, all the hygiene and the great stuff we have on this side of the planet. Would any of that been here? Hospitals, orphanages, would any of that been here? And so we look at it from the same point, and we, there's this tendency to look at our world today, present day America, and say, oh my gosh, it's the worst it's ever been. If you tell me that, then you never read a history book in your life. Because it's not as bad as it's ever been. Is it bad? Yeah. Is it worse, in my opinion, than it was when I was a kid? Yeah, in some ways, yeah. But there aren't child sacrifices not happening openly out on the street. And it did back then, throughout the Old Testament, into the Greco-Roman world. People were not taking unwanted babies and just, or, or not and just leaving them out on the, in the fields now. They're not burning them and sacrificing them to mole. There aren't, there, are there child prostitutes? Yeah. Is there enslavement? Yeah. But it's not all over the place accepted like it was back then. And once again, that's because we're looking at it from our day back and inflecting our own context onto it. Things are better. And you need to look at it that way because then you see the progress that the Lord has made. Will we make it perfect before Jesus comes back? No, not at all. But we are taking back sacred space. We are taking back the nations that were lost all the way back in Genesis. And one day at some point, I can't tell you how far along the course that will be, Jesus comes back. And then he sets it up and clears it all out, reboots, and everything is new. All right? So that's literally what was happening was Jesus was on the throne. Yes, there's still puppet governments running according to the powers of this world, but there's a lot going on through the church the believers that they can't touch. And now these people, um, their mundane lives of drudgery no longer had control over them. Their king reigned, and though it didn't look like what they had expected, not at that point, he ruled nonetheless. He rules presently nonetheless. And they had a part to play in that kingdom. They were his imagers, just as Adam and Eve were to be his imagers. God's Spirit's now moving them. There's, no, there's not fear of Caesar. They had the power and the reason to live a different kind of life. And so in our world, we kind of give this lip service. And I, I kind of hear this sometimes. Well, just get back to me when Jesus comes back to really change things. When my world is like I want it, then I'll believe that Jesus has come back. Well, if you want your world, you, first of all, you, you're missing the point. All right? We have a vocation. To think that way, to think that just get back to me when Jesus come back to, comes back to really change things, when he meets my standard. You understand? That's the problem that everybody had when Jesus came. They don't see it the way he's seeing it because they're not looking at it the right way. And so to them, he didn't do anything. So if you feel that way, if that's somewhere in the back of your mind, don't. Don't go, you know, jump off a cliff or anything. But let's think about this. Because to think that way shows that we really haven't come to appreciate just what type of bondage we are or were in at some point. Does that make sense? To think that way shows that we really haven't come to appreciate just what type of bondage we are or were in. Have we really thought about how our lives would be without Jesus? 
I mean, seriously, has he changed your life? You might, well, not enough. I'm not rich yet. I'm not the CEO yet. I don't look like Fabio yet. My wife, whatever. You have to understand, if your life hasn't really changed that much, then perhaps there hasn't really been a true turning around. Maybe it didn't get from here down into the very soul enough that we really appreciate it. Granted, things aren't perfect for any believer, but that was never promised until Jesus comes back to set things straight for the final time. Right now, you're at war. Right now, there's a job to do. We are to be servants, bond slaves, workers for the kingdom. Not sitting back, twiddling our thumbs. Well, I'm just waiting on them to come back. It feels good to do it. Oh, Lord, is woe is me. Maranatha all the time. Yeah, I want them to come back. I, right now would be good. But at the same time, I realize there's a purpose here. We're all priests in His service. That's what the New Testament says. And that is work. And as long as there are sinners, we have a job to do. We might call that job security. As long as there are sinners around, we've got job security. And if we aren't satisfied, then perhaps it's because we aren't doing what we've been called and designed to do. The most miserable people I see are the people who are not doing what God called them to do. Sometimes they know this, that they're not doing it, and they're fighting it. Sometimes they don't know it. But if we claim to be Christians and we're miserable in our existence, then I guarantee, doggone to you, you are not doing what God has called you to do. You are not a witness. You are not a disciple maker. You go to church and then you go home into your little bubble and watch your television or my television, whatever. We stay in our little worlds because we don't want any trouble. You cannot be an imager of Christ without running into trouble. You cannot do that without running into interference. You know, it's the, you know welcome to the army of God. The problem is there's a secret service. Some folks so secret, Jesus doesn't even know they're in the army. You know, not doing what we're truly called to do. We are existing as anyone else, but not willing to go out with the Word. A hammer is truly at home driving nails, but it's a most miserable replacement for a screwdriver. Now, I've tried to use a hammer for a screwdriver because I had nothing else. And if you got a claw hammer, you might attempt in vain to drive a screw in with it. You usually wind up giving up and just drive it in like a nail. It doesn't work because it's not being used for the purpose for which it was created. And if we in our Christian walk are just humdrum, mully grub, blah, 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 if church is where we come, if our Christian life is where we come once a week or maybe twice a week to a Bible study and then we leave here and it's all about just me and my personal growth and Jesus is my life coach and we're not doing anything, I'm not preaching workspace salvation here. I'm just trying to say, if we are not doing that for which we were created, then we're going to be miserable, and we're going to be sitting around, I wish you'd hurry up and come back, because this kind of stinks. There's plenty to do. Plenty to do. There's plenty to do around here. I'll go ahead and put a plug in right now. We have more holes in the children's ministry, places, a position to be filled, than Carter's got liver pills. More holes in that than there was in Mississippi State defense this year. And that's a lot. Look at this. Look at how, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But I want you to see how when they understand what Peter's saying, how this changed their lives. Look at verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted or encouraged them saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear, or awe is what the Greek word means, came upon every soul, 
and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. This is a summation of the other verses. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So Peter says here, be saved. He said the word literally means be delivered or healed from this perverse generation. And you understand the emphasis here is not just so when you die, you go to heaven. It's something's happening now. There's a reason now. You don't just stick it on the tail end. Those who believe were baptized and then 3,000 people were, were added to the 120. Now you talk about church growth. And look, I'm not sitting here talking about just getting tails in seats. Because if we had a million people in here and nobody's discipling, we're still not doing our job. The same cry should go out today. Be delivered from this perverse generation. Those who wanted to be delivered, those who saw that Jesus was in fact the Messiah, believed and were therefore delivered, baptized as new creations. And that changes something. Not, I got the get in free card when I croak. Not at all. They then lived their lives in awe, is the literal Greek word, of what God was doing through the apostles, the apostles and in their own lives. Here's, break it down. Their lives changed. But how, do you say? Were they all of a sudden rich or without troubles? And were they without issues in their lives? No, not at all. Not at all. But they now had a true grasp on reality and who their Lord, King, and Savior was. And this allowed them to live in the same cities that they always had, the same towns in the same context as they always had, always had with a new purpose and a new hope. That word means confidence, not just like, well, I hope. A confidence. Yeah, this thing's going to get turned around. And they actually have a part to play in it. And you can see a new pep in their step and a new love for everyone around them. And that is the power of the gospel for all of us. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. So they're learning, they're studying. They don't want to just be spoon-fed once a week. They're having fellowship. That's not just having coffee. They're living their lives with each other. Now I realize that's a little harder to do today because most, we don't even live next to each other, most of us. We all have, most of us have someone living next to us. They're eating together, which goes along with the koinonia or the fellowship, as a new sense of community. We're in this thing together. We're all citizens of the same kingdom. And then they are praying together, which is very hard to get people to do. If I have a prayer meeting, we're coming together for a certain night for prayer. How many, what are the numbers we'll have here? It'd be a small percentage. Why is that? We just ask ourselves. We don't think anything will happen. It's boring. I don't know. It's just a, a rhetorical question. I'll leave you with that one. But they lived in all. They took care of each other. This is not communism. Oh, yeah, they sold all their stuff and they all had the same thing. See, Jesus advocated communism. No, they still got houses. They still got property. That's part of the culture's property rights. But they were helping each other out now. Living amongst each other. They're working with each other. And then the Lord added to the church. Why? Because they were fulfilling their purpose. The two things go hand in hand. So when it comes to this, our purpose and what we are to do, or even when it comes to filling the holes in children's ministry or whatever, we need to ask ourselves a question. The question is, are we asking the right question? Because we go out and we, we, we say, look, we need some help doing this. And this is the question most of us ask ourselves. Do I want to do that? Well, I can tell you right now, if I ask that question, especially if you've got kids in the house all week, the answer is no. I don't want to do that. I've been dealing with kids all week. Or do I want to go across the street and, and knock, or whatever the case may be? Do I want to do that? The question, I mean, the answer normally for the average American, because we've come, become so individualistic, is, no, I don't want to do that, which translates to, God didn't tell me to do it. But that's not the question to ask. The question that has to be asked is, does God want me to do that? You see, that's a totally different question. 
Because one thing, if you serve God long, you're going to understand, you will come to understand that most of the time, I know how he works with me. He asked me to do stuff with which I'm not comfortable doing. It's all about getting me out of my comfort zone. I'm just not a people person. Well, guess what? I hate it for you. I just don't like children. Well, guess what? I hate it for you. It's got to be done. You're created for a purpose. So the question is not, do I want to do that? I'm an introvert. I'm an extrovert. Whatever the case may be. I can't read more than five minutes without going to sleep. I used to hear that one all the time. Well, I guarantee if you're reading something you enjoy, you can stay away. If you can read, I know some people in here don't read at all. I'm not mentioning any names, Baker. But the point is, what do I want to do that is not the question to ask. What has God told me to do? And do I see a need and, and do I, in obedience to God, want to fill that need? That's the question to ask. That's one of the questions I'll leave you with today. Because we are in need, in need of serious help. And guess what? You can't say, well, when the church gets bigger, we'll have all the help. No, we don't. Because some of my buddies pastor some big, big churches. And guess what? They never have enough help in children's ministry. Or other things. So, and does it come across heavy-handed? I don't know how, other than to just to kneel down in front of you and swoon, I don't know how any other way to say it, what I'm saying. But I do know this. When Jesus is speaking, the apostles are speaking, they're not always speaking so sweetly that butter wouldn't melt in their mouths. I'm just giving you, as George Jones would say, the cold, hard truth. So we've got to ask ourselves the correct questions. And we need to see that how the gospel really can change our lives. And if, and if our lives haven't changed, then we're, we're obviously not getting something. We're talking past each other. And we need to stop, reboot, reset. And say, Lord, all right, this is the way I do it, literally. Lord, I'm kind of stupid. I'm thick, if you don't like using that word. I'm a little thick. I don't get it. I'm remedial. I need you to break it down for me. And at that point, if the Holy Spirit's moving, and I say He is, then things begin to change. Would you all bow your heads, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the power of the kingdom and the gospel, the power of your Holy Spirit and how He moves in us and through us and what He wants us to do. And Lord, I know throughout the book of Acts, there are going to be some very uncomfortable things. The way you move. The way you want to move. And somehow, and sometimes, Lord, you change the way you do things from time to time. I get that. And we don't, we're not always comfortable with it. Father, I know that if the apostles had stayed in their comfort zone, Pentecost never would have happened the way it did. The wind could have blown through and the cloven tongues could have shown up and they stayed in that upper room because that's just not their cup of tea, because they were afraid. Because they're not people people. Because they're not eloquent speakers. Because they were un uneducated men for the most part from a little bitty hillbilly squabble of a town. But Lord, that's how you started it. And so we can always come up with excuses. But with your power behind us, Lord, walking in your will, there's nothing that can stop us other than maybe than our own excuses. So Father, I just pray that you as we're launching in kind of a we're still early in the year father that you would touch us and convict us we need to get out of our comfort zones there are things to be done there are children who need ministering to there are people out on the street that need to be ministered to there are all sorts of things lord that we have need of doing and we have the means here to facilitate a lot of that lord we just need workers in the field and father by the power of your gospel you tell us we're imagers, and you empower us, so we have no reason. Father, I just pray that you would lay that on our hearts. And if I've come across as too heavy-handed, then I apologize. But Lord God, I know no other way to say it. Move in us and through us, Lord God. And I ask you to take us forth. Just stay on us about this all week long. Okay, as we leave here and worship today, Father, I, once again, I ask you to press it on our heart. Make us a new creation. All over again, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.